So maybe you could tell me, um, as a child, you lost sports. So what did you do? Absolutely. So as a child, we were 24-7 playing sports. We would play baseball in the summer, in the football season. We would play football. We would play soccer. The family in which I was raised was really all about sports. And I sort of took that passion to a market called the collectibles market. So when I was a kid, I would uh, mow grass in the summer and then I would take that money and buy baseball cards. And in the winter, I was raised in Wisconsin, so I would shovel snow. I would take that money and buy baseball cards. And from there, I became this uh, kind of this love of the of the sports card market or the baseball card market. But you can imagine that you lost baseball cards because of the fame of these people. But why the trading? That's right. So the trading actually gave me an outlet to use sports in a market. So markets have always fascinated me. Things like how are prices determined in markets? You know, when I was a little kid, we would pay a quarter for a pack of baseball cards. And I wondered, why is it a quarter? Why isn't it 50 cents? Why isn't it a dime? And those types of questions always uh, piqued my curiosity in thinking about how do markets not only price goods, but how do they allocate goods and services to people? But you can't, I can't always almost imagine that as a kid, it is always already interesting to have those kind of questions. Yeah, so let's put it this way, that I was unusual as a kid. I think um, I had certain quirks that people might um, uh, denote is peculiar or unusual. On, on the one hand, I was um, constantly playing sports. And on the other, I had the intellectual curiosity to think deeply about questions like allocations and markets. Without calling it that, I, I thought about grocery stores and trading markets in ways I think that my um, colleagues when I was little did not really have those same thoughts. So it actually didn't surprise you that you became an economist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. I think in the end, we end up um, chasing our dreams. And if we're good enough to do the things that we love, then we can make that an occupation or a career. But somehow it wasn't only, let's say, the trading marks, but also or mark, markets, but also um, the way people act and the inequality in how people act in this market. That's right. As I, as I grew older through high school and when I was in college, I began to be uh, a dealer in these markets. So what a dealer does is a dealer brings his or her sports cards to the market and then sells them or trades them to people. And what you could readily see is that not all people were, were getting the same deal. Um, some people would pay a lot more money than another person. And even in those types of markets, you could see the inequities that were arising. And I always thought, what are the factors that, that are causing those inequities in markets? And what can we do within a free market system to lessen those inequities or make markets more fair. But there were inequities from what? From, um, what well, it could be as simple as women tend to shy away from bargaining. So what happens in these types of bargaining markets is that the dealers understand that women shy away from bargaining, so they charge them higher prices. And it happens in the used car market. It happens in the baseball card market. It happens in any market where you have bilateral exchange and you have people bargaining over the price. That's a severe inequity that can um, determine consumption and, and concern, uh, um, concerning outcomes of people that are really important, like in the labor market. Um, actually, you traded uh, these cards. Um, did you? Were you a good trader? <laughs> I was pretty good trader. Um, <clears throat> so just about every weekend, my girlfriend at the time, who, who became my wife, um, she and I would go to these large sports card shows. We would drive from Madison, Wisconsin, all the way down to Chicago. 
and we would buy, sell, and trade. Through time and through experimentation, I became pretty good at it. And I understood kind of what people wanted and how they wanted to bargain. So in the long run, I think I did pretty well. But you had your experiences. I had my experiences. So there were some occasions where I was taken advantage of. Um, I can remember one case where um, I was trading, a, a very large trade for me at the time, maybe 1000 or $2,000. And I got in return a bunch of counterfeit cards. And that, um, that sort of bummed me out. I think it's fair to say that I was taken a, a fool that particular day in the market. Mm. They were just fake cards. They were just fake cards. That's right. So I've never done that personally. When, when, I, when I buy, sell, and trade, I try to predict what will be good in the future. So, so what is a down sports card today? that will have future value for people. And then that's the, that's the game that I like to play. I like to play the trading game where I can predict the assets that will increase in value over time. I will accumulate those and then trade them back later. You call it a game, uh, you see it as a game? I do, I see markets fundamentally as a, a game, but a very important game, not a game that is, is meant to be a nonsensical game or a trivial game. Markets tend to be two player games where there's a buyer and there's a seller or there's an exchange of information. And once we understand the rules of this game, this market transaction, then we can try to optimize what we're trying to do. Many times people try to optimize their consumption according to how much income they have. That's a particular consumption game, so to speak. And then markets tend to be zero sum games where your gain is my loss and my gain is your loss. And many times markets are set up like that. And it's a very serious game. It's a very serious game. In many cases, it's a life or death game, markets are. Um, but nevertheless, if we think about it in the nomenclature of von Neumann or, or Nash, in many cases, it can be modeled as a, as a theory of games. And those theories tell us what our optimal action should be in these markets. Would you say uh, somewhere I saw you called a player? Uh, would you say <laughs> you call yourself a player? Um, a player in only the best sense. That there is, there's a negative connotation about a player, but I'm certainly an active market participant and a player in these markets. And I, I'd like to think of myself as an active participant in, uh, in the creation of scientific knowledge. And we're in, um, we're in a market constantly. You and I are in a market right now. We're exchanging information. Science is also a market. It's also a game in the sense that there are suppliers and demanders of this scientific knowledge. And <clears throat> in that way, I consider myself a, a creator of knowledge and I disseminate knowledge. Could you say that economics is this sort of game where you constantly, well, we are constantly player and, and but also changer of the rules of the game? I think that's right. I think that um, when markets are poorly constructed, you can think about the financial crisis of the last several years, there are moments that the market players who have market power tend to change the rules of the game. And we have to be very careful that we don't do that. Otherwise, people become distrustful of the game and distrustful of the market. And that's a first step in the wrong direction because markets are beautiful. Markets create wealth. They create knowledge. They create information. And we have to be careful that people trust market outcomes and people come to markets as active participants who will be happy about when someone loses, they don't all of a sudden change the rules of the game so they become winners. I think we have to make sure as um, practitioners and as scientists that we don't allow this to happen. Because that's somehow your deepest thought. It should be a fair game. Absolutely. I think in the end, everyone deserves a chance through this market or through this game to succeed. You know, as, as children, uh, we don't choose our parents. 
And if we don't set up the education game or the education market in a fair way, everyone doesn't have a fair chance to succeed. And I'm fundamentally opposed to people not having a fair chance to succeed in life. You do all kinds of experiments. Could you say that you play with the rules somehow yourself? Well, when I first studied economics, the very first book that I opened up was written by Paul Samuelson, who was one of the most famous economists of the 20th century, and Bill Nordhaus, who is one of the most famous economists working on climate change. And I was struck by a passage in that book. It said, economists cannot run experiments because the world is dirty. They must therefore sit back like a meteorologist and allow the data to come to them. And then they can analyze the data using statistical techniques to try to say something causal about the data. That, that's kind of the way the world was in the late 80s and early 90s when I was an undergraduate and graduate student. And I always thought that was wrong because it's not that I disagreed with them about the world being a very dirty place. It, it is. There are multiple markets. There are millions and millions of people millions and millions of firms and prices and the world is very very messy so it's not it's not like the the test tube that the chemist has i think that was their intuition is that the chemist needs a pristine test tube to run an experiment so they said look as economists the world isn't clean it's not a sterile test tube so we can't run experiments when i came in i thought much differently than that i thought I'm at these sports card markets where I see economics at work. Can I go in and test economic theory in those markets, even though those markets are very dirty and they're not clean test tubes? But if I could use randomization, now what I mean by that is I put some people in a treatment group, say they get the cholesterol pill, and some people in the control group say they get the sugar pill. Now all of that dirt is balanced across the treatment and control group. So I'm not getting rid of it, but I'm balancing it across treatment and control. And that allows me to say something causal about the cholesterol pill. So in a way, when I was a graduate student, absolutely, I wanted to change the rules of the game. I wanted to change the way economists do their empirical work. Instead of being passive observers and have the data come to us, and then beat it up and try to say something causal. I wanted to be an active participant in a market and go and generate my own data and generate my own data for a reason to test economic theory and then to change the world about a specific policy. I mean, why do people discriminate? Why do people give to charitable causes? Why do inner city schools continue to fail? These big scientific and social questions are what I want to go after. And I want to change the rules of the game and collect my own data and generate my own data to answer these questions. Instead of only having theory and thinking about, okay, this is or what the data says. And Absolutely. I mean, the, the traditional way in which economists and social scientists more generally think about doing empirical work is they have an idea, might be... Um, ways in which we can increase people's effort in labor markets. Then they race back to their office and they write down a theoretical model. And it's a beautiful theoretical model. And then they say to themselves, how can I test that model? Many times they don't even test it. They just write it down and send it out to the world. It's beautiful. Sometimes they say, I want to test the implications of that model. So what they do is they download mounds and mounds of data, say from the internet, and then they beat that data up until it submits and says, here's what I say. But they have to impose a lot of statistical assumptions on those data to go from a correlation to something that's causal. That's a typical way in which scientists have traditionally done 
research. Write down a model, go get mounds and mounds of data that somebody else has collected or the world gives to them, beat it up, say something about the model. Now, I, I do things a little bit differently. I write down a theory, but then I go out and generate data that are meant to test that theory. So it's a very good fit with the theory itself rather than a misfit, rather than putting a square peg where a round one should be, which is many times what you're doing when you go out and get the data that the world has given you. It sounds like science. It sounds like science. I think that field experiments have the promise to make economics into what some people would say is a proper science. I think for years, not only myself, but other social scientists have been uh, deemed as soft, as in not doing real science. I think it's fair to say that with field experiments, economists now have their full-fledged scientific cards. And their cards, that's because of the material you are providing. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, a sense to test that you are a behavioral Yeah, I think on the one hand, behavioral economics might be thought of as a, a great marketing tool because for decades, economists have been interested in behavioral economics. You can go all the way back to Adam Smith, who talked about uh, the moral hector on the shoulder and doing the right thing. Um, people don't get that from his most popular book, but he has a second book that is very behavioral. You can go all the way through the 20th century. You had John Maynard Keynes, who's very behavioral. You had Gary Becker, one of my heroes at the University of Chicago, who was very behavioral. He was talking about why people discriminate. Um, why do people have altruistic preferences? But then there was this explosion with the work of Danny Kahneman and and Amos Tversky in the 70s, and Dick Thaler in the 80s in economics, where we didn't need to invent behavioral economics again, because after these pioneers, everyone knew what behavioral economics was, what, which essentially is now adding psychology or insights from another discipline into the economic model. I think um, you could view it as um, adding some humanity to the economics man, which I think is right. In, in the moment that you add behavioral economics or psychology or, or let's just say common sense to the economics man, we can understand her a little bit more than we could with, with the straight uh, sterile model of neoclassical economics. Because actually you can't see um, economics separately from human behavior. No, that's right. I think that was a mistake for many years and in which many people did separate the model from the person and people became not very interested in questions about why people did things. I think the moment you you start the economic science, many times people simply want to measure. So they measure how much discrimination there is in a market where they measure what is, what is the gender pay gap or the difference between men and women in markets. And then they stop, where I think behavioral economics and field experiments allows you to go to the next level and say, why do people discriminate? Why do women earn less money than men in markets? And it's only after we answer the whys can we, first of all, know what model is at work? And secondly, we can then put forward public policies to combat the injustices that are done in the world only after we know why. You can know why by doing uh, field experiments. I think by doing field experiments, it's the best possible way to not only measure, for example, does discrimination exist in a market, but also to distinguish why does discrimination occur in the market. I can think of no other tool 
that is better than running a field experiment to figure out why people are doing what they're doing. But why is the why so important for economics? Yeah, well, let's talk a little bit about that. So let's, um, let's use the example of discrimination. So in the late 1950s, an economist named Gary Becker at the University of Chicago did a dissertation on the economics of discrimination. And his model was based on the simple premise that some people have a preference for discrimination. And what that means is they derive satisfaction out of harming another group. So for example, they might not like women, or they might not like men, or they might not like old gray-haired people like me, or they might not like people of, of certain races. So they treat them poorly. They don't hire them for jobs. They give them higher price quotes in uh, used car markets, for example. And his model was basically one of people had a taste for discrimination. So that's one kind of discrimination that's of course, abysmal. We don't want that. Another kind of discrimination is what Pagu, an old economist, called third-degree price discrimination. And what that was, was people discriminate in markets, not because they dislike the other person, but because they want to make more money. So, for example, I might charge women more money in a market because I know they don't like to bargain. It's not that I dislike women, I just like money and I wanna make money for myself. So now these two theories are very different. On the one hand, you have Becker who says, people discriminate because they wanna cater their prejudice. In fact, they will give up money to harm another group. And you have another theory that says, whoa, 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 wait a moment, people discriminate in an effort to make more money. Very different, very different implications. And the public policies to take on these two are very different. You can think of quotas and the like over here to take on Becker type discrimination. Now, with Pagu type discrimination, you can think of education and giving people uh, the right tools in bargaining or, or in information or education to take on that two very different types of discrimination until we know what is happening in markets we cannot even begin to put forward a public policy to take on those bits of discrimination and that's why field experiments are so important because they tell us the why's who's right backer or pagu most of my data would suggest pagu is right but um nevertheless now we know and we can take that on with public policies Yeah, absolutely. So this, this, um, this research, we should kind of back ourselves up and ask, let's look at the data from labor markets and compare men and women. And when we do that, all around the globe, you have men making, say, between 10 and 40 percent more than women. And then you start to control for things like occupation, human capital, time out of the labor force, and you still have a significant difference. Say now it's 5 to 15 percent. And then we must ask ourselves, what is causing that difference? And what can we do to get rid of that difference? Now, there were some researchers called Uri Genizzi and Aldo Rustichini and Muriel Niederle and Lisa Vesterlund who started to do lab experiments to explore what could underlie these differences. And they were beginning to find that men were more competitive than women. So this is where I step in and ask, can we generalize those insights into the field and explore what are the implications in the field and in real markets for this difference in preferences. Okay, so where I started 
was I said, why do men and women have different preferences for being competitive? So I looked all around the globe, and this is with Uri Ganesi and Ken Laddard, my two co-authors, and we said, can we find two societies that are diametrically opposed in terms of the power that the woman has in the household and in the society? And we came pretty close. We found um, one very patriarchal society in Tanzania called the Maasai tribe. And on the close to the other end of the spectrum was a matrilineal society called the Cassie Society. And what we did is we simply went out to those two societies and took the simple experiments from the lab and tried to replicate those in the field. And our first result is the differences across these societies were really enormous. When you talk to people in the Maasai tribe in Tanzania, and you ask a, a Maasai man, what is your wealth? What he'll tell you is, I have 14 head of cattle, three donkey, two sheep, and four wives. And he says, if I want another wife, I have to trade seven head of cattle, because that's a current price. Wow. The only right that women have is their husband has to visit them for 15 minutes every morning in their tent. That's the rights that women have. Really, uh, really a terrible society for women. Now, on near the other end of the spectrum are the Cassies who, when you, uh, when you jump in a cab from the airport and go out to the villages in, uh, in, in uh, right outside of Shillong, you see these billboards that they keep saying the same thing. And, and the taxi cab driver, after you ask the taxi cab driver, what, what do these billboards say? He says, oh, it's those men again. They're, they're asking for equal rights. So you have close to the other side of society where if you knock on the door of a Cassie, a man, the man will answer and he will take you back to uh, the woman of the house. And then you will talk to the woman about the issues of the day. The woman will, will make market decisions and will make decisions for the family. You know, it's gotten to the point where many Cassie men will say something like, uh, we're sick of playing the role of breeding bulls and babysitters. So these are, these are very different societies. And what we do is we run these simple experiments in these two societies. And what we find is that the Tanzanians are a lot like us in the U.S. and, and in Western Europe. The men compete a lot more than the women compete. Now, when we go to the Cassies, what happens is that reverses. The Cassie women compete like our men, and the Cassie men compete roughly about like our women. So this gives you a sense. It, it's a beginning first step. It, it's certainly not the final word, but it's a beginning first step to get to the point of what causes these differences and preferences. And I think this literature and our studies point to the power of socialization. And when we raise our, our little boys and girls, what subtle words that we say to them, subtle gifts that we give them have lasting impacts into the future. I can still remember when I was in second or third grade, I was feeling ill one day and I wasn't performing in, in, phys, in my physical education class. In my gym class, I wasn't doing as well as what I usually do. Do you know what the, the teacher yells out to me? Hey, John. Hey, John. Quit playing like a sissy. You're playing like a girl today. He had in his mind that girls should play a certain way and boys should play a certain way. And that's exactly how we're typically socialized. And I think that importantly determines our long-run outcomes. Now, our next step in this research agenda was to create a firm and hire workers and actually put out ads across the United States to hire administrative assistants. This is work with Andreas Lebrandt. And what we explored is if we change the incentive scheme from one where we tell people wages are negotiable, to another one where we have the exact same ad 
but we don't say wages are negotiable. And then we look at whether men and women, first of all, apply, and then whether they negotiate. And what we find is that when we say wages are negotiable, many, many women apply and they negotiate as much as men. Now, when we leave that sentence out of the job description, what happens is women shy away from applying and they shy away from negotiating. And in fact, the men negotiate a lot more than the women when that aspect is ambiguous. And what that tells us is that in these ambiguous or vague settings, women are taught to shy away from asking because they don't know if it's appropriate, where men, and in our experiment, it was actually the low quality men who came forward and they bargained the most. So men are taught to be aggressive as boys and go after what you deserve. So then they do it in markets and you have these inequities. I think that's right. When you look at the way our economy is set up, the, the highest paying jobs are the ones that are the most competitive. They're the ones that you build your way up the pyramid. And then when you're at the top, it's highly competitive because your firm is competing against another firm that is ultra competitive. And the world is a place of competition. But my argument is that if we can set up the wage schemes in the rules of the game in a way in which we recognize that society is handicapping certain types of people. If we set up the rules of the game at the entry level, this can systematically affect where these two types of people go in the long run in markets. But isn't it like a sports game where it's, you know, high end sports is extremely competitive? It's look, many things are extremely competitive. The question is, should we set up our wages and our, our how we pay people in a competitive way? Or are there ways in which we can set up wage contracts that get people to perform at their highest levels, but they're not cutthroat wages, you see? And, and I don't think as economists or policymakers, we have thought hard about setting up the rules of the game in a way that will give everyone a fair chance, but will still lead to really good outcomes. Because right now you have a lot of lost human talent because women shy away from these settings. There are a lot of women who are very, very talented, who shy away from settings that are too competitive. So we're essentially wasting their human capital because of the manner in which our wage contracts are set up. That's what I'm saying. Something can be done about it. I think something can be done. One example is my study that I just talked about where if we're very clear about the rules of the game and how people should negotiate, they will then negotiate as hard as they should, and they will start out with wages that are much more equal than they otherwise would be. Women should just negotiate. Women should just negotiate. You actually say that the world would be better off if women were in charge. <laughs> you know, some of the implications from our, our studies when we go overseas and look at... Um, behavior in matrilineal societies, what you have is women are, are much uh, gentler with the resources that we've been given here on earth. For example, when we look at how uh, men and women farm in, um, in and around Shillong, what you see is that when women have the choices about what crops to plant and how to rotate their crops, they tend to be much kinder and gentler to the soil than what the, the men will be. So in this way, you have some indications that on some dimensions, we would be much better off having the gentle touch of a woman. Absolutely. Could you say they play different games? I think they are playing very different games. I think men are playing a, a much shorter run game over there and women are playing the long run game that we need to continue to, um, let's say, nurture this land and it's going to be ours for a long time and we want to live in a symbiotic way where the man might just discount the future a little bit more than women and they're playing a, a different fundamental market game and, and in this case farming game than women are. 
other thing you have been doing with field research is for experiments is um, in education, mm. which is a very important part of your work as well. That's right. And That's right. What have you tried to do? That's right. So my work in education started about a decade ago. Um, there's a local community around Chicago called Chicago Heights, and they came to me with a plea. They had read about some of my work in the New York Times Magazine on charitable giving. So I, I work a little bit on the economics of charity. Why, why do people give to charitable causes? And they wondered if I could come into their school district and help them. And I visited the school district a few days later. And what I found was a school district that was in very difficult shape. They were, they have two high schools and they had about a thousand kids entering the ninth grade each year. And only about 470 of them were graduating from high school. So you had this community that was largely in trouble with its public education. So we began to use field experiments to try to learn about why that inner city school was failing. And in the last 10 years, I've been thinking hard about using Chicago Heights as my laboratory. And in this sense, it's a field experimental laboratory that is meant, first of all, to test economic theory. So we have different theories about what's called the education production function. You know, how do the inputs such as children's effort, parents' effort, and teacher effort map into outcomes that we care about? Outcomes like finishing high school, outcomes like going to college, outcomes like getting a high paying job, outcomes like being a better citizen in our global community. So we, we started thinking hard about how those inputs affected the outputs that we cared about. And then also, how can we change those inputs? How can we fundamentally change the effort levels of parents? Or how can we fundamentally change the effort levels of uh, children or um, or teachers or administrators? Sounds a bit, little bit like market work again. Absolutely. So this is markets now again. Now, when I started this research, I, I, I thought hard about what do we know in public education? Because in the US, we've been at public education for over 100 years. You, you should say we should know a lot. But I think public education got caught in this rut whereby they more or less took this Mark Twain quote is, once you have ignorance and confidence, then success is ensured. So I think people were ignorant and confident that they knew what was happening and then for years here in the States, especially our public education system was broken. And I think it's fundamentally because we use our classrooms to simply teach our kids. We don't use our classrooms to teach our kids and teach ourselves what works and why. And I think we need to change that mentality because this is life or death, much like medicines, you know, in the medical community, we figure out which drugs work by testing them, by using science and testing whether a heart medication works better than another heart medication, better than the control group, which receives the sugar pill. I fundamentally don't understand why we don't take that mentality to the classroom. And all around the world, we should be using our classrooms as laboratories laboratories of innovation to figure out what works, why does it work, and how can we make the world a better place through education? Because fundamentally, we don't, as I said before, we don't choose our parents. We don't choose a community in which we're born into. And if we don't give these kids an equal chance to succeed, we are leaving so much human potential on the table. We've talked a lot about equity here. Equity is giving everyone a fair chance in life, and that's important. But you can also talk about efficiency. I don't think we've wasted this much human potential 
since the Dark Ages. When you look at our technology that we have in place around the world, and you look at all of the human potential that we're wasting because kids are not receiving proper education, that's a crime. That's a real crime. And it's because we have not been serious about using field experiments in the classroom to learn about what works and why. So, so what kind of experiments did you do? Or are you? Yeah, so in Chicago Heights in the last decade, we've been running a number of field experiments. And let me tell you about one with teachers. So for decades, people have argued about whether teachers should be paid for their performance. So some people say, if a teacher does a really good job with her students, then she should get paid a bonus. Other people say, no, 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 we don't want to add money to this equation because great teachers don't value money. They value teaching, per se. So some people have gone out and they've explored a typical way in which to pay a teacher a bonus. What they've said is in September, they tell teachers that if you do a good job, you will be paid a bonus next June at the end of the school year. And by and large, they haven't really found very promising results. It, it, they've been small and inconsequential. So that's the place where we started. We said, can we start there and use behavioral economics to make the incentive better? So our idea was, what if we took a group of teachers and in September, we actually gave them the bonus up front and told them, we will take the bonus away from you unless your students achieve. If your students achieve, you can keep the bonus. If they don't achieve, we will take it away from you. And what happens is that incentive scheme works in a brilliant way, um, as an example. If your child was placed in the classroom of a teacher who received that clawback incentive scheme, they, their test scores actually advanced by about what's called 0.2 standard deviations above the control group, which turned out to be several months of education. So you're basically getting several months of extra education because the teacher is in this clawback incentive scheme. Now you might ask yourself, why does that clawback incentive scheme work? We can go back to the days of Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky. They wrote about something called loss aversion. And what that means is that people value losses much more than they value comparable gains. So a dollar loss is felt much more acutely than a dollar gain. So we're leveraging that insight. If you use your introspection and say, hmm, Am I like that? Many of us are like that. We really do not like losses. So can we leverage that as a public policy tool? We found we can. We found that teachers will work a lot harder if you leverage loss aversion. Now we've done this also in other venues too. We've gone to China and we've looked at Chinese manufacturing workers and we've used the exact same incentive scheme We've said at the beginning of the week, here's a bonus. And if you work hard on Friday, you can keep that bonus. And we compare that to the idea that work hard all week will give you a bonus on Friday. The loss of version one works a lot better. And in fact, we did the one in China over a six month period. Over all six months, the manufacturing workers worked harder when they were getting the bonus up front. So this is a useful way to leverage behavioral economics to make the world a better place. You did the same with students. We actually did the same with students as well. So you might ask yourself, how can I make my child work harder? So our experiments with students is the morning of the test, when they enter the room where they take the test, we announce to them, here's $20. If you perform better than you did on your last test, you can keep the $20. If you don't perform better, we will take the $20 away. And what happens is those students significantly increase their test scores in an amount that you cannot even imagine compared to people who we tell them, we will give you $20 if you perform well. 
those people perform much worse than people who you give the $20 to. Students as well. We did. We then saw the teacher results and we said, will that work with students? But we did a little bit differently with students. We had them enter the test room and then after they entered the test room, we announced our incentives. So they did not have time to prepare. We were just looking at the morning of the test, can we give them incentives in leverage loss aversion and get them to try harder and perform better on the test? So what we did is we gave a big group of students $20 and said, if you perform better than you did on the last test, you can keep the $20. And we compared their test scores to people who we said, if you improve on your test score from last time, you will receive $20. What happens is when you give students $20, they perform much, much better than if you tell them you will receive $20 in the future. That's a, I think it's a very important insight about what are tests measure. When you, when you look at these standardized tests, they're not only measuring innate ability, but they're also measuring effort or, or how hard students try on these tests. Do we know why? Is the why that we don't like? Yeah, I, I think the underlying reason why loss aversion works is because people develop a deep pain or a distaste for something that they have to give up. So my own research, it started back in 2003 in the sports card market. I tried to explore why do people not like to trade? Why do people not like to give something up? And what I found back then was it looked like it was a pain of giving something up. That's why people did not like to give up or trade what they owned. So now recently what we've done is we've placed people in fMRI tubes and we've looked at their brain activity and we've explored really inexperienced people and what their brain activity looks like compared to people who have a lot of experience in trading. And people who trade a lot they tend to code trades in a different part of the brain than people who are inexperienced traders. And in particular, the people who are experienced do not go to the loss part of the brain. And people who are inexperienced go to the loss part when they have to give something up. So it, it sort of uncovers through the market and through fMRI uh, or uh, imaging of the brain, it tells you why people, when they gain experience, why they can trade more. How can we benefit these kind of ideas? Absolutely. I think the major reason why markets work is because people trade. You have people who trade, by definition, the seller gains and the buyer gains through a trade. So if we can contemplate why there's a lack of trading in markets and we can figure out why doesn't the market work the way it should, we can then design incentives to get people to trade more in markets. What we find is that there is not enough trading in markets or the market gains are smaller than they should be because of loss aversion. So what can we do to make the market function more appropriately? My argument is you have to give them a sense of overcoming loss aversion and that's through market experience. So you have to give them trades and give them, let's say, free trades, so to speak. And once people trade and trade and trade, they don't have loss averse preferences anymore. That's how we can use it to make markets better. So we have to change the rules somehow? Or? I think if we somehow change the rules to make people want to trade more when they first enter a market, the market can be more efficient in the end. That's right.